Holy shit. shit. <laughs> Guys, you know me. Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. I am very blue today as you can see. I'm blue. <laughs> if you don't know me, I love doing reading vlogs. I love reading vlogs. Oh, they're my bread and butter. They're the core of this channel. I love it. I love it and it gives me that buzz. It's It feeds exactly what I want to do. I was thinking to celebrate just hitting 3k, which is like it's crazy, but what I thought would be fun for us to do together was you to pick what I read for a week. So I've made a Google Doc, I'll put a handy nifty thing in here of all the choices that you had, and I said pick three, vote on them, and whatever wins I'll read. So this was all my physical TBR apart from some books I recently hauled and wanted to do a book haul showing them before I put them on the document and some books that I have specifically planned for certain other themed vlogs that I didn't want to go in this. And I just picked three audiobooks off of Scribd because if I added all my saved books from Scribd, this would be ridiculously long. I've got the form up on my laptop. We have had 322 respondents, which is crazy. What? That is shocking. I thought we'd get like 100, maybe 100 of you would vote on it, but 322 of you have voted on this, which is crazy. And that means I think we've got a really good consensus on what you're gonna want me to read. That's almost a thousand votes, right? Okay, okay, okay. We have four clear front runners. There's some other high numbers, but there's four that are like much further ahead than the others. So the most voted one is The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Now I spoke recently about my shame at never having read this, but this is, you know, a book that everyone has read. It's one that everyone speaks so, so highly of. I feel like I have to read it. And this 29.8% of you voted for that with 96 votes. That is a really, really high amount of you. I don't know why you all want me to read this. Do you all just think I'm gonna love it? Or is it just so many of you guys' favorite books that you think, yeah, I'll definitely vote for that one. I don't know. So next with 90 votes, which is 28% of you voted for this, is The Poppy War by R.F. Kwang. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I've been putting this book off for years. I'm not kidding you. I've owned this for over a year and I haven't read it. <laughs> uh, what I just hear? Everyone who reads it loves it. I know it's about Rin. And I think she goes to like an elite military school or something. I don't really know. I don't want to know. I just want to go into it. But like, this is one that a lot of people have been reading recently. Like, for the first time. I think it's because maybe the third one is gonna come out soon. It's still so popular, whereas some fantasy books come out a few years ago and then they kind of die down. Whereas I'm every day I'm like seeing someone review this. I'm scared. <laughs> and then we have two books tied, each with 81 votes. So the other audiobook is You Should See Me in a Crown by Leah Johnson. So this is a new release. It came out like two weeks ago, and I think it's got a female female romance about this girl who wants to become prom queen so she can get the scholarship to go to her dream college but then she starts falling in love with another girl who's running for prom queen and it just sounds so cute and I've seen so many people whose opinion I trust and who I often have similar opinions to loving this. I think probably so many of you have voted for this one because it's a new release and because there's been a lot of hype around it in the past two weeks and maybe you want to read it too and you want to find out if I like it before. And then the last book I'm going to be reading and this also has 81 votes with 25% of you voting for it and that is The Night Circus by Erin Morganston. Oh! If you've been here a while, you know that The Star of the Sea by Erin Morganston was probably my second favorite book of last year. I loved it. I thought it was incredible. Words cannot describe. Genius! Like pure genius. You lot have made a damn well good decision. I hope you're pleased with yourself. We've got these beautiful sprayed edges. The cover is insane. And like, look at the inside. Don't you die! All I know about this is that it's two magicians battling it out, a circus arrives without warning, I'm expecting the same vivid imagery, wonderful writing Erin Morganson has. You guys are giving me two very intimidating physical books that I've been putting off for the longest. I think we'll start, because it's got the most votes, we'll start with The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas, so... Go! <laughs> I'm here to enjoy myself, GC style, do you know what I mean? I am... Just, I think I'm just over a quarter of the way through The Hate You Give. I can see why everyone loves this book so much. I can see why it's such a popular book. I think it is incredible. I am aware of how often this is the only book people read 
about the black experience. I, 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 ne I don't want to say the wrong thing because... I don't want anyone to be able to think, oh, I can just read this book and then I'm done, which I don't know why you would think that. It is incredible that you should be reading other books than just this book. And also, like, this is a very important and is pertinent the right word? It's a very relevant book for us right now, as obviously it's about our protagonist star witnessing her friend being shot and killed by a police officer. But I also want to push you to, like, not only read books about black trauma, I feel like they are often the most popular books about black protagonists. And when I'm reading this, I'm like, it's so important. And I'm, I'm very happy that in this video, I'm also going to be reading You Should See Me in a Crown. Because as far as I know, that's very much about black joy, about black love. In terms of the book, <laughs> I'm loving it. I think the way that it is dealing with loss and with pain is so good. It's so powerful. The plot is moving along at a really great pace. And usually when I'm listening to audiobooks, at first I, I start listening to this, I listened to like the first 10 minutes and I was like, oh, I don't listen to this as an audiobook. But actually the narrator is incredible and it's getting better and better as it goes along the audiobook. I think this is one of my favorite audiobooks I've ever listened to. So I take back <laughs> that initial assumption. But I did tell a bit of a lie there. So I really recommend the audiobook. I think that often in audiobooks, I struggle sometimes to connect to the minor characters, which can be a drawback of listening to the audiobook. But this one, you know, her parents, her brothers, they feel like such in-depth and vivid and vibrant characters and so different from one another. And even when you only spend a 15 minute scene with, say, the grandparent of the boy who was shot, there's such a complex character in such a short amount of time. I'm just loving it. I've, I've, li I've, li I've listened. I tried three times. To, I think about three hours of it today which I never listen to that much of an audiobook in one day. Like, I've just been trying to do as much as I can. That means I can listen to the audiobook. So I literally just got out of the shower. I was about to start doing my makeup, listen to the audiobook. I looked and I realised I'm 75% of the way through the book. <laughs> so I should probably check in with you about what I'm thinking right before the end. I love it. I think it is an incredible book. I don't really know what I can add because surely you've heard from everyone else why it's so wonderful. I'm so happy that it is as popular as it is and so many young people, you know, maybe people who don't read as many books as you and I do and stuff, people who don't watch booktube, but people who read, like, because it's so popular, they are likely to pick it up and they are likely to learn so many important lessons from it. Not only about police brutality, but about the ways in which black communities, particularly in America, have had a scythe taken through them by the prison system there and how often young black men are left with no other opportunity turn to things that they don't even want to do, but their situation that the government really power all the way down, police, everyone has put them in that. Um, exploring white privilege, you know, she has a friend that is racist, really. It's about Star exploring that and about someone who she's thought she's been friends with, believing and thinking all these terrible things. And it's just such a powerful book. And I think it is something we should all read. But like I said, we should read other books other than just this. It is one of the most assured books I've listened to or read in a long time. Characters doing and saying things, not that shock you or you don't expect, but like isn't the easy answer, isn't just the, the, the easy response, you know? And that shows that these people in the book from Angie Thomas's mind have real lives in a way. I mean, obviously they're not their fictional characters, but these people are real. So I finished The Hate You Give. The ending was really, really good. I liked how it explored activism and stuff like that. Often in YA, there is a tendency to tie everything up with a bow for everything to be fine but that's not always the case. Um, so I like the, the fact that it wasn't a neat ending. I am gonna give it four stars. It didn't feel like a five star. You've been very, very harsh. Nice to meet you, Kelly. Very harsh. It was a brilliant book, but I just don't feel like I can give it five stars. But also like, I feel like maybe the first three quarters could have been a five star, but in just that last quarter, there was just some pacing issues for me. Like there were scenes that happened 
that I can accept and are commonplace earlier in books, you know, like in the first half, kind of as filler scenes to allow you to get to know some of the characters and their motivations and stuff, but they didn't advance the plot at all. And I was just kind of like, why are we reading this? Like, why, why is this happening when it doesn't need to happen? I appreciated it, but I feel like those types of scenes should have been earlier in the book. Because in that last quarter, all you're really wanting is everything to kind of come together and to know what is happening with this plot line, what is happening with this plot line. And we were kind of like introducing some things that went nowhere. It's a brilliant book. It's an important book. And I hope it's something that if you haven't read, you get around to soon. Because I'm so happy that I got around to it. Four stars. Pretty successful start. So now let's get into the next book. I'm a massive fan of the dictionary. You know, we should be like promoting the dictionary anyway because like it is such an amazing like historical British thing, isn't it? I'm only 60 pages in, but I'm loving it. I'm obsessed. I think it's incredible. I think it's gonna be a work of art. I'm loving the school vibe that we're at. I'm loving the academy. I'm loving the training. I'm loving all the different characters. Why are you so in love with me? Jesus, tell me I wanna know. When you hung on the cross, you died for me. Cause everybody knows. I am about 300 pages into this. It's about 500 in total. I am loving it. I'm obsessed. It is so well written. It's one of the most well written books I've read in quite a while. It's so engaging. The pacing is incredible. The amount of stuff she's fitting in without it feeling overwhelming is is so good. We've kind of spanned about three years, three, well actually no, probably about five years really, in terms of content. This could have easily been split into a trilogy, just this one book alone, from what I can see so far. There are three parts. And I was reading part one and thinking to myself, some people would try to make this into a whole book on its own. Because in the first part, Rin is a orphan. She's like adopted into a family, but they're not nice to her. And they try to marry her off. So she goes, no, I'm going to take this really prestigious test and try to get into kind of the military academy. And she does so. She works so hard. She gets in there. And then it's her story of battling against adversity at the academy, but also like working super hard to be the best that she can be and discovering her abilities and who she is, if that makes sense. And I love the school vibe of this. I, if you're looking for something with like an academy, a school feeling in a fantasy book, I loved it in this. I don't think we'll be going back there now that what's happened has happened in, in kind of coming into part two. I love the history, the mythology, the politics behind every single calculation. I love the part that we're in now. I can't even tell you what's going on. The most exotic fruit we can find. The hell Bananas. Just what it also does really well is we have a lot of characters throughout this and I have a feeling we're gonna meet a lot more. They're all well-rounded enough to not feel empty. The main story is Rin. Rin is such a protagonist. She's at the forefront of the whole story. But the characters still feel engaging. They still feel well thought out. It's so vivid. So vivid. Sometimes in some books, like in The Never Tilting World, I struggle to visualise some of the drama, dramatic scenes, some of the fight scenes. But the fight scenes in this are like... It's like a movie in my head. It's so well done. Holy, Holy shit! shit. <laughs> Guys, you know me. I'm so happy that you voted for me to read this. Wow. I had been putting this book off for over a year. It threw a lot of curveballs at the end there. Oh, I love it. It's like a 4.75. It's not quite a 5, but I'm going to give it a 5 on Goodreads. I love how Rin is flawed. You know from the first chapter that she is going to commit actions that you don't agree with. You know, you know from the get-go that we're going to go down that path. However, you don't know to what extent. I loved the beginning of this. I loved the vibes at the academy, that kind of like magical academy. But I read the, the last part, two parts much quicker. But they're kind of like a blur to me. But the, the ending, so good. And I'm so excited for where the rest of this series is going to go. My dad just ordered the second book. Because I was like, I'm going to order it. Because I want it on my shelves. But this is technically his book, so... They'll be on his shelves. I'm just not going to be better about it. I'm not fuming. I'm like, I'm a little bit, but yeah, no, I'm bothered. I'm bothered. I'm really bothered. <laughs> there, there is a chapter in this that a lot of people say how hard it is to read. 
and it, it it's it's such a hard chapter to read and this more than any other book I've ever read I'd say you must be aware of the trigger warnings for this as someone who has had to study like in politics stuff like that a lot it's important to remember like that's not only fiction you know this this book is heavily based on truth and our world and there are horrors they may not be committed by fire gods <laughs> but there are horrors that happen in our world too and it was very 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 realistic when you read like in politics when you're studying these kind of events of what those events are i just think it's a great book so if like me you've been putting this off for a year get to it hello just to say i appreciate i really appreciate the opportunity fuck off julia mccain apologies Oh, you actually can't see any of the stains. I thought you'd see all these stains. They're highlighter. And this top is very comfy, so I'm not about to get changed out of it. it ain't, I'm not wearing something that's actually dirty. Those stains are never going to come out. I am 150 pages into the Night Circus. I'll try and hold it up as I'm doing this. And I am obsessed with it. Hey. <laughs> Success! It is magical. It is incredible. It is amazing. It's one of just the most enchanting things I have ever read. So we are following the story of... I want to know, what does it feel like to be so goddamn ugly? Two magicians, kind of. They're both particularly skilled kind of in illusions, but illusions of different kind. They don't have the exact same skill set. And one of them is the daughter of a really renowned magician. Her father agreed with this guy that... <laughs> How many people were scared? Me too. I was really, really scared. <laughs> I look crazy. Her father agreed with this guy that they would do a competition. And apparently this is a competition they've done multiple times before. We don't know how you win the competition. We don't know what the rules of the competition are. And so then this other guy went and found a kid that would be his subject, essentially. The Night Circus, which will be what the book is called, is kind of the place that the competition is now going to take place. The girl is hired as an illusion artist there, whilst the boy is the assistant of the guy who's running the circus. So he isn't able to like go round with the circus, he has to stay with London while the circus tours. So that limits uh, how much he's able to do, because where, where, whereas the girl, Celia, was there every night performing, he has to kind of construct tents that will work and be part of the game in his absence. I love Erin Morganson's writing style, like it is still as wonderful as the Starless Sea for me. A lot of people's critique is that it's boring and I do understand why for some people they would see it as boring. Like it's, it's a very slow book, the pace is not fast by any means. You are distanced in all of, in, I was saying all of Erin Morganson's books but this is only, she's only got two books. Um, <laughs> You are distanced from the characters somewhat. You are not supposed to necessarily relate to them. You are not supposed to understand them. You are not supposed to feel like you are in the story with them. You are very, very distanced from the story. And for people who like plots to be really heavy or for people who like to feel really immersed, well, no, this is very immersive, but for people who like to feel like they are there with the characters or they can relate to the characters, like, this is not gonna be the book for you. I love a concept, you know? Like, it reminds me, the reason I love Erin Morgan's book so much is that it reminds me of back when I did drama. Everything was a concept, everything was an experience. And, like, it's so meta because that's what the circus is like in this. You know, the circus is this big experience, this concept. But Erin Morganston's books, oh, don't worry, I am blending that. Um, <laughs> Erin Morganston's books are that as well. I love the dramatics of it. I love how it's not afraid to really go there, you know, and to push the boundaries. It is brilliant American literature. And I don't care what anybody, it is. It's lit, it should be taught in schools. And I've, I've often said I love in stories, and this isn't something that stories do very often, but where they really bulk out the story and tell you things that aren't necessarily essential to the plot. Building up the wider world and exploring other parts of the world and how other minor characters are affected. That's something that this book is doing so, so well. The vibes today are just perfect. Like it's really gray out 
and windy and I just feel like that adds an extra dramaticness to the reading experience. <laughs> I, I've been sitting there and like the wind has been blowing in and I've been like, oh my god, this is so dramatic. I love it. So I'm not quite as far in as I wanted to be before I checked in again. I'm about 250 pages in instead of 270. I... I'm in love. I'm in love. The mystery, the intrigue. Ah! Erin Morgan's is writing does something to me. I just sit there in awe at this book. I am completely immersed. It is, it's fan dabby dozy. Shut up! That is so stupid! Erin Morganston is a fucking genius. Like, legit the best writer history has ever known. It's so mysterious. So many things are slowly revealed to you. Time is not linear, the plot is not linear, and you get nuggets of information from different characters. Then you you slowly piece the puzzle together for yourself and it is brilliant. This is inspiring me for plot in the kind of book I wanna write. I feel like I've had like a fucking epiphany. Oh, calm down, calm down. It's so good. I love the circus theme. I love a circus. I love a circus. I love how absurd it is. I love how all over the place it is. I love how unclear it is. Like, I don't want to be served up all the information on a platter. I want you to, like, tease stuff out and drag stuff out and, like, confuse me. So I finished the night circus. I'm giving it five stars. <laughs> Who gave it the right? To go off like that, I- Paramedics, paramedics, make sure she's okay. Because I was not ready. Not. Erin Morganson has solidified herself as one of my favorite authors of all time. This bitch can do no wrong. The magic in this, the atmosphere in this, her writing is the most magical writing I have ever read. I was not expecting the ending. I really enjoyed the ending and I, I feel like the Star of Sea had this as well where there's like the promise of more. The magic doesn't stop with the last page. There's the there's the promise of some elements of the story going on beyond the book itself and I really love that. Like it really invites you at the end to use your imagination and to figure out how it would have ended and to think of all the different possibilities for the situation going into the future and I just think she's I think she's a genius. I love how everything interweaves. Erin Morgerson is great at having a lot of characters, a lot of storylines like perfectly mesh into one another. Do I prefer it to the, the Starless Sea? I feel like the Starless Sea will have a special place in my heart forever because it's her the first book of hers I read and so her writing was completely new to me and completely blew me away and the writing still blew me away in this one but like I kind of knew what to expect. I need more Erin Morganson books please. I was gonna say more books set in circuses but like no none of that will compare so actually I don't want it. All I want is more Erin Morganson books. <laughs> I'm going to find me Darren! I am about 30% of the way through You Should See Me in a Crown. Well that's the worst we've had today. I'm really enjoying it. I don't typically read loads of contemporaries like this. I haven't read like a good back to high school YA in a long time. I feel like I'm back in secondary school. Leah Johnson's great at writing teenagers. Like that's, it's a really hard thing to do. It should not be underestimated how freaking hard it is to write how teenagers speak. It's so hard. It's so hard. Like just phrases like your mind, you know, stuff like that gets me and I'm like okay you get what's going on we're here let's go we also have that kind of like evil girl at high school and I I I enjoy that I feel like if you're gonna write a high school YA book you kind of need that girl and like let's be honest that girl exists this is about a girl who has set her sights on this college the fund that she was counting on falls through and so she doesn't have the money to go to that university unless she wins prom queen. However, she is very unlikely to win prom queen. And so it's gonna be the story of her and her friends trying to work really hard to get her to that because like her school is obsessed with prom. It's their thing. It's like, I think this is somewhere in the mid, like middle of nowhere America. These people don't have a lot to do with their lives. And no, 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 no shame. Um. So they just love prom. They just love <laughs> prom.
prom, she is starting to fall in love with another girl who is running for prom queen. And it's so cute. I'm totally vibing with it. They've only just started in, like, I'd say the last 5%. I think they're a really cute dynamic. The other girl is very talkative, on the go, quick, 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 like a bit all over the place. And I just love it. Pairing that with someone who's very school orientated, disciplined. I love that clashing. So now I'm now 70% of the way through You Should See Me In A Crown. And I am enjoying it. I think it's somewhere between like a three and a four star right now. So the couple got together like 50% of the way into the book. And whenever that happens, you know, well, shit's gonna go wrong. Come on, again, I- And it has gone wrong just now. <laughs> Although I understand like it has to have conflict. The story has to have some kind of conflict to move it forward. I am not annoyed, but like I wish it hadn't it had to be in the relationship because I just want to see some gay girls who are happy. Like I'm fed up, not fed up, but I feel like every time I read a sapphic romance, the relationship is always very fraught. I understand that it's necessary and maybe if it hadn't have happened, I'd be like, the book's boring. But I just wish that the tension could have been somewhere else other than the relationship because I just want to see them happy. And I think by the end, everything will be fine. It's a funny book. It's a light book. It's really enjoyable. The audiobook narrator is wonderful. Like I, I would really recommend the audiobook to you if you haven't read this book yet. But I feel like I don't have anything really, really notable to say to you about the book other than I'm enjoying it. I think it's really good. I think it's a great sapphic YA that you should be looking to pick up if you haven't read it already featuring a black girl as a protagonist. It's a book I'm struggling to be analytical about in any way. I'm just kind of sitting back and enjoying it. It's very much like those 80s, 90s chick flick vibes. I think it's really strong in that department. It feels like I'm watching Clueless or something like that. They're like my favourite films and so I think because of that it's kind of taken me back a bit and I'm just sitting back and listening rather than thinking of what I can say to you. So I am really enjoying it. I think it's going to end up being a four star, especially if it has a strong ending. So I just finished it and I did really enjoy it. I really enjoyed the ending. I thought it was just a nice wholesome book and really well written. I think it's going to be like a 3.75 for me just because I just wanted a bit more oomph from it and that's not really something that I can like necessarily put into words. <laughs> um, I just felt like it was lacking a bit of punch. Six months to a year from now, I think I would struggle to remember parts of the plot or remember why I enjoyed it so much, if that makes sense. I feel like it, it lacked memorability in some ways, but I still think it's a brilliant YA contemporary. And I think it's also important that you guys remember, like, this isn't a genre I ever really rate super highly. The For me, the audiobook was on Scribd, so check if it is on Scribd if you have it where you live. I really, really loved the audiobook. I thought that the narrator did a great job of bringing the book to life. That was my video, reading the books that you guys voted for. I had so much fun reading these books and you picked so well. Like if we're honest, this is one of the best <laughs> reading vlogs I've had in terms of me enjoying the books. So obviously I need to trust you and your taste and what you think I'll like. Thank you for watching to the end if you have. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I will see you very soon with another one. Bye.